Welcome today to a video about a very important topic Potassium rich foods in the renal diet They have been telling you for ages that bananas, potatoes, avocados, tomatoes and so on are very bad for you Today we know however that this is fact the guideline has changed now. Nephrology providers must update their knowledge and stop telling people to avoid eating foods that are good for them. Now, I will start by saying that despite what the title of the video may be, I will never tell you to disregard what your nephrologist or your PCP may tell you. I know that a lot of nephrologists will still go by the old mantra, never let a slice of tomato pass your lips. But let's face it, that kind of advice won't help you at all. It's mostly a way to unload on you the blame for a failure of the whole healthcare industry. Yes, that's some bold statement right there. But I will motivate what I'm saying with hard facts. Starting with one simple fact, study conducted on people in stage 3 and 4 of CRF, those who were instructed to eat more fruit and vegetables were able to witness a miracle. They saw their decline in GFR completely stop. In some cases, they reversed the progression of CRF. Yes, some of them actually had an improvement in kidney function. All that thanks to a way of eating that was richer in fruit, vegetables, and potassium. Now, what I want to point out is that those who reverse GFR decline were also told to disregard most cautions regarding potassium-rich foods. They were instructed to eat potatoes daily. They were told to eat vegetables with abundance, including those rich in potassium like kale, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. One of the main concerns, other than low potassium levels with avoiding high potassium foods, is that some high potassium foods are really, really good for you. Certain high potassium foods are so good for you that you must eat them. The avocado is an example. Avocados are rich in vitamin C, E, K, and B6, as well as riboflavin, niacin, folate, pantothenic acid, and magnesium. They truly are nutrition powerhouses. Avocados are also so rich in antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds they can protect from oxidative damage which is associated with the progression of diseases. Avocados are also very rich in fats. While most fruits mostly contain carbs, avocados won't spike your insulin when you eat them. Another super healthy food that many people have been told to avoid is broccoli. Broccoli is definitely one of the healthiest foods on earth, a true powerhouse of nutrients. It's reputed to benefit digestion, the cardiovascular system, and the immune system. Research also tells us that eating broccoli fights the inflammation in the body. This tidal veg also has detoxing properties, very useful to lower your creatinine levels, thanks to unique phytochemicals. These plant compounds aid all steps of the body's detoxification process, from activation to neutralization and elimination of contaminants. Even the humble banana has useful properties beside the potassium content. Bananas are also a great source of vitamin B6, very useful, and of various antioxidants and phytonutrients. And what if you have diabetes? Well, eat bananas unripe. A high proportion of the starch in unripe bananas is resistant starch, which passes through your gut undigested. Unripe bananas have a GI as low as 42. The starch turns into sugar when the banana becomes ripe. So the greener the banana, the less sugar in it. But as always, with diabetes, moderation is key with fruit. Now guys, I also want to point out that not everyone is supposed to start eating high potassium foods right away. So we have seen new guideline doesn't just tell nephrologists to give more potassium to everyone. What the guideline orders is that potassium intake should be individualized. What that means is that select patients about 1 out of 5 must still avoid high potassium foods. 
at least until the issue that causes their potassium to be too high is resolved. But not everyone, all right? In the past, everyone was told to just avoid high potassium foods. The guideline says that it's not like that anymore. Now, the guideline, also known as KDOQI, is the rule book every nephrologist and primary care physician must follow when dealing with people with CRF. I mean, if your doctor is not doing what the rule book says and you are harmed by that, you can literally sue them. So question, are you supposed to start eating more potassium? Now, this is very important. Those with too high serum potassium levels are not recommended to eat more high potassium foods right away. They are supposed to first take care of what is actually raising their serum potassium. This is of course only true for those with already high serum potassium levels and it's important to understand that why eating high potassium foods doesn't really raise serum potassium in a significant way, having too high serum potassium is still dangerous. Thing is, however, that only about 1 out of 5 people in any stage of CRF has high potassium. You can tell if your serum potassium is too high by taking a look at your last lab test. If your potassium is more than 5.2 milli equivalents per liter, you should take action immediately. Remember that avoiding high potassium foods is totally not enough to control serum potassium. It doesn't really help. So if your potassium is more than 5.2 milli equivalents per liter, speak to your nephrologist as soon as possible. Current guideline states that nephrologists should investigate the real cause for high potassium levels and correct it. If you have too high potassium levels, your nephrologist should check. If you are constipated, if you are taking enough insulin if diabetic, if you are doing RRT often enough, if you need it, if you have metabolic acidosis, and if you are taking certain medicines, especially ARBs and ASIs. These are the real causes of high potassium levels. Addressing them will solve your issue. We know today that for those with kidney issues, having too high potassium is just as common as having too low potassium and it's also just as dangerous. We know that having too low potassium levels is a cause for heart issues and it's also crucial to understand that someone with CRF is way more likely to pass away due to heart-related issues than CRF itself. Having more potassium from your foods also means that GFR is going to decline slower, as we have seen. So if you look at your last test and you see that your potassium is below the normal level, which is 3.5 milli equivalents per liter, as we can see, take action. Book an appointment with your nephrologist as soon as you can and start changing the way you eat. Having too low potassium is very bad for you. It damages the kidneys as we have seen. It's dangerous for your heart. Some studies are even linking low potassium levels to diabetes. We know today that poorly managed type 2 diabetes or T2D in short, do cause potassium levels to rise. This is a dangerous complication called ketoacidosis. This is one of the causes of high serum potassium in those with CRF. Now, some studies are stating that, on the other hand, those with too low potassium levels may be more at risk for insulin sensitivity issues and T2D. If your potassium levels are too low, your body may make less insulin. That could lead to high sugar levels. So you will be more at risk for T2D. Those who already have T2D may be even more in danger because having too high sugar levels is clearly a serious risk for them. There isn't enough evidence today to prove that low potassium directly causes T2D. There is, however, evidence to say that having too low potassium, which is way more common in CRF than people realize, will cause you many serious problems, including a higher risk of losing kidney function and even more risk for death. So I'm very glad that the new guideline states that potassium is not the enemy anymore. And I believe this change will really benefit patients that will get informed about it. Question, what other changes should we be aware of? As I was saying, the guideline, the rule book for CRFs change. This means that many aspects of your treatment are going to change too. Another thing that changed in the new guideline is phosphorus. This basically changed for the same reason potassium changed. 
The bioavailability of potassium and phosphorus in plant-based foods is substantially lower than previously thought. So telling people to avoid peas, soy foods, corn, and so on based on phosphorus content is wrong. Now we also know that phosphate as an additive, like what you can find in dark colored colas, some processed meats or baked goods is still bad for you because it's way more bioavailable and will still give you problems. Now maybe the biggest change in the current guideline from the old one is protein intake. New guideline says that everyone with CRF stage 3 to 5 must avoid protein. New guideline is pretty restrictive about protein intake and I believe that's a good thing. And I've been advocating for the LPD for years and well it's frankly great to see that the world of nephrology is going the same way I go. What you must know about this way of eating is that it imposes the need for supplementation. If you want to know more, I've talked more in depth about this in my video up here. So in conclusion, I hope that potassium in foods is now a bit clearer for everyone. Remember that this is not me telling you to disregard what your nephrology says. This is me telling you that getting informed and advocating for yourself is the only way to get better with your kidneys. I'm also telling you that this is a complicated subject that requires a team effort and your doctor will put way more effort in if they see you advocating for yourself, if they see you getting informed. Now guys, if you want to know more about what foods really help, I think my video up here may be really interesting for you. And this is all for today. Thank you for watching. God bless.